Hello travelers and anybody who is maybe even new to the channel. This is going to be my read through for Zoe Punches the Future in the Dick. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Um, on this channel I do many things from video game playthroughs to movie reviews and some book read throughs on occasion as well. So that's what you're here for. Welcome. Anybody returning, welcome back. I'm glad you're joining me for this next one. I need to preface this before I get into it too much. I just want to say this is by no means a professional read through. I have no doubt that an actual an official audio book is currently in the works for this uh, book. <laughs> I just love these books so much. The author, David Wong, also known as his actual name, Jason Pargan, is honestly one of my favorite authors. I love his style. And for years, I've read everything from John Dies at the End, This Book is Full of Spiders, and What the Hell Did I Just Read in that respective trilogy. And for this current series, I recently, very recently, finished Futuristic Violence and Fancy Suits, and now I'm so excited to start this new one. I know we're um, in November, almost in December, but and this came out in October, but uh, here I am regardless. So again, to preface this, this is by no means a professional read-through. I might stutter, I might slur a little bit, I try to avoid to typically and maybe correct it in post, but regardless, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoy it. Is, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be doing voices and having fun with it. And it's honestly my first time reading it as well. So I'm very curious to see how this goes. But um, without further ado. <clears throat> in a future in which everything is possible. In a city in which anything goes. Zoe Punches the Future in the Dick by David Wong. One. Zoe Ash surveyed the carnage and said, Sorry we're late. It was my cat's birthday. The man who greeted her on the sidewalk was named Hank Kowalski. He was bald and had the eyes of a man whose favorite joke is just a shrieking child falling down a flight of stairs. He wore a jacket with a flashing logo that said Ash Security will use deadly force. Looking a little too amused for the occasion, Kowalski said, So, the good news is, the hostage taker knew to ask for you by name. Why is that good news? If it's somebody you know, that raises the chances this ends in disaster and creates a cool scene for when they eventually make a movie about my life. Maybe the guy's an old boyfriend? He likes psychopaths, right? He stuck a finger into the air. He's up there. Zoe looked up and then down, then up again, trying to make sense of what she was seeing. All the buildings downtown were skinned with display panels and synced so that a giant obnoxious ad could scroll down the whole block. For example, right now an animated banner was hopping from building to building and promoting the beginning of Halloween month in Tabula Rasa. Rasa has a dollar sign for the S, by the way. Warning slash promising that the city would not be enforcing public nudity laws for the duration of October. But the panel on the building in front of her was dead, leaving a dim gap in the display. That was presumably because of the ragged hole in the glass a few floors up, like a Godzilla had stooped down and taken a bite. Directly below the hole at ground level, the main entrance was blocked by an overturned food truck. Zoe was familiar with the truck just by its shape. It sold lightly charred strips of Korean barbecue on little sizzling, self-heating metal plates with a side compartment of melted cheese for dipping. It was one of the five best food trucks in the city, so this incident had already taken a terrible toll. Did the food truck fly into the building? Don't be ridiculous, Kowalski replied. A guy knocked over the truck with his bare hands, then shoved it across the door there to barricade it. Then he ripped a parking meter out of the ground, jumped straight up, and, while dangling from a ledge with one hand, smashed out the glass in the fourth floor, using the parking meter like a club. Then he entered the building and declared that everyone inside was his hostage. Then, Zoe thought, he demanded to speak to her. This time last year, she'd been restocking the muffin case at the coffee shop where she'd worked for minimum wage plus tips. Oh, well, that's, uh, said Zoe, fear causing her mouth to just give up halfway through. I agree, said Kowalski. I'm thinking either he's gotten some implants to make him stronger, or else he's really pissed off. Not an old boyfriend, then. I don't think I can make somebody that mad. Maybe you gave him a disease. Kowalski took a bite of a hot dog. There was a nearby vendor who was doing brisk business with the crowd of gawkers who'd shown up to watch the hostage situation unfold. 
The hot dog guy, who had apparently acted quickly to seize the Korean barbecue truck's territory, had a grilling apparatus strapped to his torso, complete with a rack of condiments. He wore a beat-up metal exoskeleton to help him carry it all, and Zoe thought he looked like an old-timey one-man band. On the side of his grill was a looping animated logo of a smiling, sentient hot dog, happily taking a bite out of a smaller, regular hot dog. Zoe tried to puzzle out the grossly unfair rules of the society depicted in the hot dog logo, then realized she was still a little bit high. In words filtered through chewed hot dog, Kowalski said, Nice outfit. He didn't mean it. She was still wearing her party clothes, a black pleated skirt that an asshole at the party said made her look like a table lamp, and he was right, and a black t-shirt bearing a symbol of a Jolly Roger. Only the skull was replaced with a cat's face, and the two crossed bones were a pair of fish skeletons. Her black hair was in pigtails because she had thought it was funny earlier, but it now seemed inappropriate for the situation. She had arrived in a leopard print BMW convertible though she could never put the top down as it made her huge, fat head a target for snipers, according to Will Blackwater and her other advisors, who did nothing but sit around imagining worst-case scenarios all day. The car could be any color she wanted, she'd sprung for the programmable skin, but she left it leopard print for the last month only because it seemed to annoy Will, who at the moment was emerging from the driver's side. Will was an unreasonably white man in his late thirties, wearing a suit the color of a wet sidewalk, and the expression of a man who's just realized the wetness is piss. Will, suspiciously fake-sounding menacing surname Blackwater, shot an annoyed look at the crowd of gawkers behind him, each one representing a potential complication, and asked, How many hostages? 68 employees, said Kowalski, and 52 sad sack customers. Those numbers punched Zoe in the gut. It would not be good if she got sick here in front of the onlookers and their many cameras, not good at all. It should be noted here that no one involved in this conversation was a police officer, and none were coming. In tabula rasa, you got the policing you paid for, and sometimes not even that. The building the pissed-off guy with superhuman strength had smashed his way into was the Night Inn Cuddle Theater. For 250 bucks, an attractive member of your preferred gender would curl up with you in pajamas and watch a movie in a small private room with a wet bar, snacks, and a fireplace. There was no sex. That theater was down the block, and they actually charged it a lot less. Kowalski took another bite before speaking, as if he preferred to talk while he chewed. Entrance from the parking garage is blocked, too, from the inside. We can unblock it, but the guy says he's got a sonic device that'll scramble the brains of everybody in the building if we try. Zoe, utterly failing to sound unsettled by this, asked, Is that a thing? Who can say? They're inventing new things all the time. I even remember an era when a guy couldn't jump 30 feet in the air carrying a parking meter he'd plucked from the concrete like a dandelion. Are we waiting for the rest of your people to get here? Will said, they're getting into position. They were all in the process of executing a plan that had been hastily thrown together after they'd gotten word that the hostage taker would talk only to Zoe. Will had advised against her coming to the scene at all, and the sensible part of Zoe's brain enthusiastically agreed. But then a key piece of information had been relayed to her. Much to her surprise, she apparently owned the Night Inn Cuddle Theater. Thanks to a large inheritance, Zoe owned a lot of things she still wasn't aware of, some of which were just incredibly illegal. So this was in fact her problem, and there was just no getting around it. Still, they intended to stretch the guy's only talk to Zoe rule as far as possible. Will said hostage situations were like bad marriages, one party trying to subtly force the other to surrender inches at a time. Kowalski said, I'm going to finish my hot dog and then go supervise crowd control, unless you want me to climb up and shoot this guy real quick. Will and Zoe both glanced back at the gawkers. The crowd was being kept in check by large men in suits with black pants and bright yellow jackets. Well, they weren't Zoe's people. They were from a popular security service called the Vanguard of Peace, its logo a glorious sunrise over the silhouette of a waving child. They'd been called in to help control the crowd and build by the hour. They also were quick to get brutal with anything they arbitrarily deemed to be a riot. Those yellow coats really showed the blood. The prospect of this turning into a night of car-flipping chaos was part of what was turning Zoe's insides to jelly. Will said, Yeah, control the crowd, and the VOP. Will noticed something over Zoe's shoulder and said, He's here. A second vehicle pulled up, 
A panel truck with an animated Ash development logo on the side. Cartoon workers assembling the letters out of girders. The truck parked and the rear door lowered like a drawbridge, revealing its cargo to be a gleaming black metal object roughly the size and shape of a crouching rhinoceros. A butterfly-sized drone buzzed in front of Zoe's face, bearing a tiny camera that was probably one of 500 tiny cameras watching her at the moment. If you enjoyed live-streamed human tragedy, Tabula Rasa was an all-you-can-eat buffet. Zoe smacked the drone aside with her hand and said, Can everybody hear me? Are you all in your spots? From a nearly invisible earpiece in her right ear, four voices spoke at once, rendering all of them an indecipherable jumble until one person finished their sentence with, Hot Link. Zoe said, Let's try that again, one at a time. Bud? A man with a Texas drawl said, The hostage taker's name is Dexter Tilly, 20 years old, frequent customer of the Night Inn. You've never met him. Inherited a house from his grandma, sold it a week ago, and used the cash on bootleg skeletal and musculature rating implants. Can't find anybody who'll admit selling him a brain-zapping contraption, but they do exist. Will said, We're obviously going to assume he has it. Bud said, Echo's with me. The voice of Michelle Echo Lean chimed in. Every time Tilly came here, he requested the same girl, a 19-year-old named Shay Laverne. She is currently in the room with him. So, you've got over 100 hostages, but it's looking like this is about her. Oh god, Zoe thought. The guy fell in love with one of the professionals. She now feared the sheer awkwardness of the encounter more than death. Well, that all sounds terrible, said Zoe. Where are you now? Bud and I are both inside, trying to keep the inn staff calm. You are? How did you get in? Zoe had been told they were waiting at the scene, but didn't know they were, like, in the scene. Bud said, we were here before Tilly. Been tailing him all day. You were tailing him, but arrived before he did? You do your homework, Bud said, and you can tail from in front. All right, way to earn your paycheck. Wu, you in position? Wu was Zoe's personal bodyguard, who the hostage taker had specifically demanded not accompany Zoe to the meet. Again, they intended to push the envelope as far as possible on that demand. A hushed voice in her ear said, I am. Where? the fourth floor of the Hyatt across the street. Zoe turned and looked behind her. The front of the hotel flashed in an animation of a waterfall cascading and breaking over the main entrance. There was a world-class seafood joint on the top floor, and there were animated fish swimming around up there. Occasionally, one would go leaping out of the water, and a shimmering silver tuna would break the boundary of the roof and soar into the actual night sky, a projected hologram picking up the animation as one smooth motion. The tourists love stuff like that. Wu said, When you turn to look at me, anyone watching will immediately know why, that you are looking to your sniper. Oh, right. Andre? From her other ear, she heard, I'm right next to you, getting a hot link. She turned, and there he stood, a large black man with a shiny bald head, squirting mustard onto a sausage he'd just bought from the one-man band. He said, See, now you're giving away my position. Already this whole thing is a train wreck. And did you see that Halloween month ad that ran up there? Since when has this city had public nudity laws? Andre actually was in position. His job was to remotely pilot the shiny black thing in the back of the panel truck. Zoe looked it over. I thought you were supposed to get the scariest drone you could find. This just looks... fancy. It's piano black. It looks like a sculpture some old rich guy would want to have in his parlor. It's scarier in motion. SWAT teams in Israel use them for hostage negotiation all the time. Well... They don't really do all that much negotiating. So the hostage taker can talk to this thing and I can talk back through it? Will said, even better. It'll display a live hologram of your face to the front end there. That way he gets facial expressions too. That's important for building rapport. When I talk, it'll switch to mine. It sounded like Will had used one of these before. Zoe would have to remind Will to never tell her that story. There was a scuffle in the crowd behind them, some of the spectators getting roughly shoved back by the yellow jackets. The agitators were mostly guys in their 20s, and they were mooing at Zoe like cows. Zoe was well-known in the city, but not necessarily well-liked, and at some point, her detractors had decided she was a cow. They sold t-shirts and everything, depicting her head on a cow's body, only drawn to mimic Zoe in cartoonish yet hurtfully accurate ways. They even included her missing tooth. The first time she'd seen one of the shirts, she'd been eating at a cafe with her mother and bodyguard. She had rolled her eyes and snickered and actually made it all the way back to her car before she burst into tears. Zoe said, 
can we push those people further away or something? And by something, I mean have Kowalski shoot them in the crotch. Will looked surprised. I'd bring them closer if I could. If the guy is near that opening, I want him to hear the chants. She thought about asking why, but ultimately decided against it. Will liked to hear himself explaining things a little too much, so she tried to ration it out. From her earpiece, Bud said, Get to a screen. Looks like the hostage taker is about to make a statement. As Will went for his phone, Wu spoke from Zoe's earpiece. He has re-entered the room. He has the girl with him. He just moved behind the window frame, trying to stay out of view. Will brought up Blink, a searchable network of just about every running wireless camera on Earth. The top trending stream was titled, Night in Hostage Crisis, Big Death Toll Assured, Alert, Possible Cow Slaughter. Dexter Tilly appeared on screen. Well, sort of. He was using a digital mask to cover his face on the feed, and it replaced his head with a fairly realistic animated skull. Unless the guy actually was a talking skeleton, which, if so, Zoe thought it was weird that Bud and Echo left that out of their summary. When Tilly spoke, his voice had been filtered too. It was a high-pitched, taunting tone about what you'd expect from a skeleton possessed by some kind of evil spirit. Now I see you down there, bitch. No negotiation, no tricks. You hear me? I'm ready to die. I'm ready to take everybody with me. Are you? Reading the concern on Zoe's face, Andre said, I think they all say that. Will said to her, I'm in contact with the rapid entry team. They're 90% sure they can take him out before he triggers whatever device he's got, if he even has one at all. They don't even want to get paid. They'll do it for the exposure. Last chance. 90%? Would you board a plane that had a 10% chance of crashing? I once boarded a plane that barely had a 10% chance of not crashing because, like now, my other options were worse. And what are the odds the hostage makes it out of a raid intact? Shay, that was her name. I've seen what those ribbon guns do. No, this requires finesse. Andre, send in the giant robot monster. Andre tapped some icons on his phone, and the shiny black thing in the truck blinked to life. It whirred and beeped and birthed itself from the cargo hold in unseen wheels. Once free, eight mechanical legs sprained from the sides, lifting its body six feet off the ground. Every inch was covered in that reflective black shielding, like it had been sculpted out of a moonless night. It was the most terrifying thing Zoe had ever seen. Andre said, It's patched into your phone. It's calling you now. Zoe dug out her phone then physically recoiled when a full-color hologram of her face appeared where the spider's head would be. Holy God! Andre said, Whoa! That's actually even creepier than I intended. Private military groups also use these things to take out tanks, said Will. The two front legs have plasma cutters that will slice through two inches of armor. It can take a direct hit from a railgun. The skin will heal itself from damage. You could riddle it with 50 caliber fire and watch the holes disappear in ten seconds. Zoe stared at the thing, transfixed. Wait, where did you get this thing again? Andre said, Rented it from a friend, though you wouldn't know he was a friend based on the deposit he demanded. Do I want to know how much? Can you really put a price on something like this? Oh, God. All right, let's do it. Two. The piano black Zoe ghost face spider drone monster clicked along the pavement to ooze and ahs from the crowd. It hopped onto the overturned food truck and then, without hesitation, skittered right up the building's darkened facade, toward the ragged opening in the fourth floor. It pulled itself into the room with a quick, jerky movement that was much more arachnid than robot. Zoe held her breath. Even from street level, they could hear the terrified shriek of a young girl from inside. Well, Zoe thought, <laughs> we've already traumatized the hostage. She watched the machine's camera feed from her phone and saw a brief, blurry glimpse of a young woman before, before a figure stepped into view and the screen went dark. What happened? Andre said, uh, He covered the drone's camera, threw a blanket over it or something. Can we uncover it? If not, Zoe thought that seemed like an inexcusable design flaw. Will said, We can, but won't. We don't need to see him. Not yet. As long as he can hear us. Go ahead and let him think he accomplished something. Open the line. I'll do the talking. Zoe found a speak icon and pointed the phone toward Will's face. Drones swarmed around them, and just about every bystander had a blink camera pinned to their clothing. Everything they said was being streamed to an audience of maybe millions, from dozens of angles, everyone watching their follower counts tick upward. Zoe saw several people in the audience with gadflies, the little drones everyone had been buying this year that hovered around their shoulders, live-streaming their lives in a way they could also get their face in the shot. 
Will asked, Can you hear me? From the phone, a normal human voice, the dumb skeleton filter only worked on Tilly's own camera, said, Who's this? Put the cow on. My name is Will Blackwater. I work for Zoe Ash, solving the problems that aren't worth her time. Listen closely, because I'm not going to repeat myself. Each breath you draw from this moment forward is a precious gift granted to you by Miss Ash. After each said breath, I want you to silently thank her and appreciate the grace she has bestowed upon you. Her patience, however, is not boundless. I'm not here to listen to your demands. I already know your demands. Your true demands, even if you do not. You demand to remain alive and to be forgiven for your trespass. If you leave immediately, we will all return to our respective homes, and I will plead to Zoe on your behalf for a reasonable punishment. I cannot offer any guarantees as to what her response will be. If you do not leave immediately, however, the machine before you will cut off your head and rip those implants off your bones. It will do it so quickly that you won't even register the movement. The speed of its limbs is restricted only by air resistance. This is an A8 disruptor made in Germany. It took exactly three of them to disable an entire division of Iranian tanks during the Blue Sky Raids. So let me be absolutely clear. You can still win here, but only if you define victory as leaving that building with your body intact. Will stopped talking and muted their end. No response. Zoe wondered if his attempt to paint her as a cruel and omnipotent overlord was undermined by her outfit. She had wanted to change clothes, but Will had advised against it for reasons that he hadn't had time to explain. She needed to remind herself not to accidentally press the spot on the seam of her t-shirt that would make the cat start singing a sea shanty consisting entirely of meows. Zoe said, If he tries to detonate the sonic gadget or do something else stupid, how are we going to fight back if we can't see him? Andre said, The Disruptor's own AI will take over and kick his ass. A human operator would just slow it down anyway. In Zoe's ear, Wu said, I do not have a clear shot. The A8 is between me and the target. I can just make out movement beyond the... Whoa. I, uh, think the negotiation phase has ended. There were crashes from inside the building. The crowd gasped. Some people even backed away, realizing that there was, in fact, no reason this conflict couldn't spill out of the building and wipe out a dozen of the gawkers before they even had time to crap their pants. Zoe, realizing she made their same mistake, took a step back from the noise. Uh, just to be clear, the brain-melting device he said he had... It can't penetrate the walls of that building, can it? We'd be safe out here? Will looked surprised. Whoever said that? From inside the building came a noise like a car being stomped down a manhole by an angry giant. The battered carcass of the 8-8 disintegrator, or whatever Will had called it, came flying out of the hole in the wall. The crowd below screamed and scattered. Zoe ducked. The mangled black monstrosity crashed onto the sidewalk and rolled into the middle of the street. A self-driving bus detected the obstacle and braked in time. Then, a cherry-red human-driven convertible on monster truck tires rear-ended the bus. A boo went up from the crowd, and there was a brief euphoric moment when Zoe thought they were booing Tilly, having come around to her side. Then, she figured out they were mooing. Will stood up and straightened his suit, standing in a spot where he'd quickly placed himself in between Zoe and the wreckage. Zoe took a long breath to steady herself and pushed her banes out of her eyes. To Andres, she said, So do we just lose the deposit, or do we now have to pay for the whole thing? I think it's important to remain calm in these situations, so I won't go into detail about the exact financial toll of tonight's operation until it's all said and done. Tilly's animated skull appeared on the blink feed again, and the silly skeleton voice said, My patience is done. I want the cow. Not her lawyer, not her bodyguard, not her pathetic toys. Will shot a quick, almost imperceptible glance at a nearby drone before saying, Wu, do you have the shot, or is he back behind the window frame? He is behind the frame, and also I have the shot. These rounds can penetrate the steel beam and then detonate in a spot of our choosing, perhaps inside of one of Tilly's eye sockets. The problem is the female hostage is sitting right next to him. Zoe said, Plus, if you miss, or just hurt him, he's going to activate his brain gadget for sure. You'd be giving him no choice. If he has it muttered Will, casting an annoyed glare at the building. Zoe followed his gaze and said, Look, I know how you say you hate unknown variables more than Abe Lincoln hated ceiling fans. I'm sure I've never phrased it like, but I'm obviously going in there. Everybody wants something. We'll make him an offer. It's by far our best chance of this not ending in utter disaster. There was nothing in the world Zoe wanted to do less than she wanted to do this. At this point in the night, she was supposed to be extremely drunk and full of sushi, sloppily hitting on some high-society kid who was looking to do something his parents wouldn't approve of. 
Zoe, if you give in to this guy, next week you'll have another one just like him, holding up another of your joints, making bigger demands. You'd be laying out the welcome mat. Well, tonight I'm worried about tonight. Now, how do I get in there? I'm going with you, said Will, never taking his eyes off that ragged hole in the building. He has to know that only I can make the kind of decisions he wants made. This wasn't true, but Zoe knew why Will had said it. If Dexter Tilly was watching literally any feed about his own hostage situation, he was also listening to everything they said right now, including the exchange with Wu moments ago. Being on camera every moment you were outside your home meant every conversation, facial expression, and mannerism was a performance. It was an adjustment that Zoe found difficult, because only a psychopath would find it that easy. Of course, Tilly himself had to know that Will knew Tilly was listening in, and would thus deduce this would be a performance on Will's part. But he also knew that Will knew that he knew, so maybe Will's performance was intentionally inauthentic, so that Tilly would think Will was lying when in reality he was telling the truth. Zoe was starting to get a headache. Will looked her in the eye, getting serious now. You know what to do? I've been in a hostage negotiation before, Will, multiple times. As a hostage, yes. This end is more complicated. Sure. So, again, I ask, how in the hell do we get in? It turned out their method for reaching the busted-out hole in the side of the building was, in fact, just a big-ass ladder. The fire department was on hand. They always came when called, but would send a bill later. And they had one that would extend from the top of the overturned food truck up to the opening. Unfortunately, nobody had a second smaller ladder to get them from the ground on the top of the truck, so Andre rolled over a trash can they could use as a step stool. Zoe stumbled six or seven times on the way up, even with Will awkwardly trying to help her. It was almost like Andre had picked the single clumsiest option possible. The crowd loved it. Will then led the way up the ladder, disappearing into the spot where most of the floor-to-ceiling window had been bashed away. Zoe followed, the rickety ladder shaky with every step. She was coated in cold terror sweat before she was even halfway up. There were drones swarming below her, and they probably had a great view of her black with white polka dot underwear. The pervs who zoomed in would find the white dots were tiny skulls. Live female wardrobe malfunction. Blink also never lacked for content or audience. Finally, she climbed through the opening into the room, tumbled across an end table, and thumped to the floor. She stood, brushed broken glass off of herself, and smoothed down her skirt. She accidentally brushed the wrong spot, and the cat on her shirt started meowing to the tune of Blow the Man Down. Meow, 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 until Zoe found the off switch in the seam about two full minutes later. When she finally looked up, there were three sets of eyes staring back at her. Zoe said, Uh, hi. Huddled in the corner was a weeping woman Zoe assumed was Shade Laverne. Thin, pale skin, huge brown eyes. Auburn hair cropped into a pixie cut that swooped down across her forehead. She had ears that stuck out a little, giving her an elven look. Silk pajamas with little cartoon bunnies. Zoe suspected the night in Cuddle Theater kept Shay very, very busy. Sitting on the ornate bed was a chubby guy who didn't actually look 20 years old, which was the age Bud had given her for Dexter Tilly. She'd have guessed an awkward 15 or 16. Slump shoulders, acne, hair he'd buzzed off presumably after realizing he couldn't do anything with it. He had a wispy failed mustache, and his hands were black armored gloves, designed to let an overpowered person punch through metal without pulping their fists. Along his shoulders and elbows were ugly inflamed surgery scars, the aftermath of an in-and-out back-alley procedure with no post-op care. Zoe had seen body scars, and in one case, the actual skeleton of a guy who'd gotten the implants, it was a super strong black mesh woven through bone and tendon, like their innards were wearing sexy fishnets. Somewhere in there was also a little thumb-sized device driving it all, the text that made the whole thing possible, called Raiden. It could generate enough power to bring down a building. She'd seen it. Will, softening his tone so radically that it physically startled Zoe, said, You're Dexter, right? How are you doing? Not good. She had seen Will do this before, adopting a manner that implied he'd entirely forgotten the vicious conflict that had occurred just minutes earlier. Someone told her the technique was called gaslighting. Zoe assumed they called it that because it really confuses people, just like if you stopped in the middle of a conversation to suddenly light a fart. Will nodded. Let's see what we can do about that. He turned to the girl. And you're Shay? How are you holding up? In a tragically hopeful voice, the girl said, You were at the police? Zoe said, No, I actually own this business, 
much to my surprise. I'm Zoe. This is Will. He works for me. What? Where are the police? Zoe said, Ah, you're new in town, aren't you? Dexter answered for her. Shay moved here in the spring. He turned to Shay and said, Ain't no laws in Tabula Rasa. Ain't no laws in Tabula Rasa. Zoe said, I'm new myself. I got here less than a year ago. This actually isn't even technically a city. And the laws do exist. Whatever is illegal in the U.S. or the state of Utah is also illegal where we're standing. But it turns out laws only mean something if there are flesh and blood people around to punish the bad guys. Most of the police here stopped showing up to work a long time ago. So security pretty much falls to whoever owns the property. And like I said, I'm told I own this place. Mr. Tilly here apparently knew that, so here we are. Will went to the wet bar and poured himself a scotch. Without looking up from his glass, he said to Tilly, You seem to know who Zoe is. Do you know who I am? I know enough. You're one of her people. One of her people? Open your eyes. Zoe is 23 and is wearing a cat shirt and a necklace with a pendant that says my eyes are up there. You don't wonder how she ended up in charge of an organization that owns buildings like this and has people like me? I don't think I give a shit. You should, said Will in his eerily friendly voice. You see... Before Zoe came along, this and many other establishments were owned by a man named Arthur Livingston. He helped build this city. This was all a bunch of dusty construction sites just 20 years ago. A whole lot of people tried very hard to stop him at every step of the way. None succeeded. Arthur passed away last year, unfortunately, leaving his fortune and businesses to his daughter, Zoe, who, prior to that, had been living in a trailer park in Colorado and working as a barista. Some parties who had previously known better than to cross Arthur wrongly decided that his passing was the time to strike. They have since found out otherwise. Do you understand? You people say business when you mean organized crime. Zoe said, and honestly isn't that organized. A swarm of camera drones buzzed outside the hole in the glass behind them. Surely tens of millions were watching by now, waiting to see if the situation would explode, hoping it would. Will sipped his drink and seemed unimpressed. Zoe didn't know if he was annoyed that the bottles were too watered down or that they weren't watered down enough. Do you mind if we sit? Dexter shot a glance outside. We're not staying here. We're not. You think I'm an idiot? My general intelligence is in the 98th percentile. Look it up. You have a sniper on the fourth floor across the street behind the fish. Room 412. Chinese looking dude. Do you not see my people out there on the street? Do you not hear them? They tracked him all the way up to his perch, reported back to me every step, listening to every word he whispered in your ear. So we're moving to another room, away from that opening, away from your sniper, away from those cameras. Tilly picked up a backpack that looked like it had never seen a day in the wilderness. If his lethal brain scrambler existed, it was presumably in there, though it looked to Zoe like it was bulging at the seams with the clothes, like the kid had packed everything he owned. You're coming with me, he said to Zoe. To Will. You're going to turn your ass around and take the long, sad climb down that ladder. This is between me and her. Will said, You don't want that. You're not negotiating with her. You're negotiating with me. She doesn't even know what she has to negotiate with. Stop with all that. I know all about this bit. The negotiation. You saying you're going to do all the talking. I've seen the streams. I know what you're trying to do. And if you say one more word in that direction, I will punch your balls into space. Will stared down Tilly, and in a horribly casual voice asked, Woo? You have the shot? Dexter's eyes went wide. He snatched Zoe by her shirt and yanked her over to him, his arm around her neck, using her as a human shield. Shay screamed. Zoe didn't, but did think she was going to piss herself. Will, calm as wind chimes, said, Woo? If you hit Zoe two inches below her rib cage and one inch to the right of her spinal column, you'll punch a hole through her abdomen that she'll likely survive. Set the round to detonate six inches later, inside Mr. Tilly's torso. It'll blow him in half, implants or not. Zoe said, We're not doing that. Wu, do not shoot through me. Don't shoot at all. I'll go with him. Will, stay here. Will, stay here. That's an order. Dexter Tilly apparently didn't have too much faith in Zoe's unquestioned authority over her organization, as he kept her in the human shield position and quickly dragged her backward toward the door leading out of the room. He picked up the backpack and called for Shay to follow. Zoe thought this would have been a perfect time for the hostage to hurl herself out the window, jump down to the food truck, and sprint off into the crowd, leaving the problem to Zoe. Instead, Shay climbed to her feet and voluntarily followed them into the hall. Zoe couldn't blame her. When push comes to shove, 
almost everyone complies. 3. Tilly slammed the door behind Shay. Will did not follow them through. Zoe knew he wouldn't. Tilly asked Shay, Where are the showers? What? The employee showers. In the lounge. You mentioned it before. The th th 13th floor. It doesn't show on the elevator, but I can make it stop there with an eye scan. Let's go. Zoe spent the elevator right up, filling her mind with wild guesses about what this guy wanted to do in a group shower setting. She nervously fidgeted with her necklace. They arrived to find the employee lounge was locked behind a sturdy door that wouldn't even open for Shay. Probably some automated lockdown system. But Dexter calmly tore the door off its hinges and tossed it aside. Inside was a break room with a few sofas and vending machines and a huge framed list of staff reminders on one wall. If a hand goes under your clothing, gently resist and remind the guest of rule number four, be nice. A couple who appeared to have been hiding out in the room recoiled at the sight of them. The guy was in a white suit with a white cowboy hat perched above unkempt eyebrows. The girl was a stunning Filipino woman half his age. The woman, whom Tilly apparently did not recognize as Zoe's associate Echo Lean, screamed, Oh my god, don't kill us! Zoe thought it was fairly convincing. The guy in the hat, Bud Billingsley, acted like a man who was frantically trying to size up the situation while remaining cool, which probably wasn't a performance. Dexter nodded toward the door and said, Out. Zoe was hoping he'd demand they stay, as Bud and Echo both had way more experience with this kind of thing than she did. Apparently, Tilly thought that'd be too many hostages to control. The couple hurried out of the room, and Echo, in her panic, left her purse behind. That purse, Zoe was sure, contained some kind of weapon or gadget she could use to disable Dexter in an emergency. Right as they reached the door, Dexter said, Hey, you forgot your purse. Nice guy. Echo hesitated, but went back and picked it up. Her eyes met Zoe's, just for a second. Echo's look seemed to ask if Zoe was okay, if things were under control. Zoe tried to project confidence, but guessed that her own expression only communicated that she'd made a horrible, horrible mistake. Both of them left, and Dexter led Zoe and Shay into a connected, tiled room with a half-dozen private shower stalls. Tilly drilled his gaze into Shay and said, You told me they have showers. I never asked you why. I want you to tell me. Tell you what? Why do you have showers? Zoe didn't understand the question, and it was obvious that Shay didn't either. The other thing Zoe didn't know at the moment was if Tilly was live-streaming this encounter himself. He could have one embedded in his belt buckle or anywhere. It would help to know if he was still performing for an audience. Zoe said, Let's not get sidetracked. The clock is ticking before somebody on the outside, either my people or some other group looking to make a name for themselves, tries to storm this place. Let's work out a deal, and then I can go back home. I think my party guests have left, but there should still be food. Answer my question. Shay looked pleadingly back and forth from Dexter to Zoe. I don't... I don't understand. The showers are for the staff. You work up a sweat doing this? Lying there? Watching movies? Not always, but... But sometimes you want to shower after doing it. After having to lay there with some damp fat ass for two hours. Got his B.O. all over you, right? Shay didn't answer. Dexter said, Or maybe you just need a shower anyway, because you just feel gross inside, having some ugly guy rubbing up against you, his bad breath in your face. A shower, to try to put it out of your mind. No, it's not like that. Still locking eyes with her, he asked, Did you ever shower after our appointments? No. No. Zoe didn't know if Tilly could spot the lie in Shay's eyes, but Zoe could. Without a word, he went to one stall after another, turning on the water. While he was distracted, Zoe surreptitiously pulled out her phone and typed in a search. Hostage negotiation strategies. In the 30 seconds she had to browse the list before Tilly returned, she saw something about reassuring the guy that any previous actions were easily revocable and making a big show of listening to demands. Then there was something about extracting concessions in exchange for meeting lesser demands, like food deliveries. Finally, just delaying until the bad guy got tired and gave up. God, she's going to be here all night. She heard his shoes coming her way and quickly put the phone away. There's recording gear that can penetrate walls, he said. But it shouldn't work this far in, and it can't handle that background noise. That means it's just us. Dexter put his arm around Shay and pulled her close. She tried to suppress her tears, but failed. 
He said, Shh, and kissed the top of her head. Zoe said, First of all, the fact that this city is a lawless clown orgy works to our advantage here. Nothing has happened so far that can't be easily fixed. Nobody's been hurt or killed, and insurance will patch up the window. That's the big thing we all need to keep in mind. If we want, we can all go back to normal. Dexter held up a hand to stop her. See, here's the problem with that. Your normal is my hell. Okay, so tell me what you want. This stopped Dexter. It was like he actually hadn't been expecting this question. He suddenly seemed nervous, like he'd been put on the spot. Zoe thought that where most guys had at least a little confidence, this one only had a dark cellar where he stored his shame. So, every weekend I'm here, with Shay. I buy back-to-back -back sessions when I can. We talk, we hold each other, I pour out my heart to her. We cry. The first time in my life I've had this. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I've been invisible my whole life, until now. I feel her press up against me and I become real, for the first time. So two weeks ago, all I did, all I did, was ask if I could see her outside of the sessions, if we could go have coffee. She says no, and that's fine, no big deal. Next time I come, they tell me I have to go with a different girl. Shay has blocked me. Zoe knew without having to consult the hostage negotiation guide that this was not the time to tell a crazy man he's being crazy. Women get their faces smashed in doing that. Anything she said that challenged him or made him feel small would just be seen as an attack. So what in the hell do you say? Zoe said, That must have been hard. There, that should do it. But, you know, that's not the fault of any of the hundred other people in the building, so... How about you let us move the snack truck that's blocking the front door and start getting those people out of here? You don't want to hurt them. And what do I get in exchange for doing that? What do you want? I want Shay. You want them to let you make appointments with her again? No. I want Shay. My only possible life is with her. If I can't be with her, I have no life. And I'm taking as many people with me as I can. Zoe started to tell him that perhaps the terrified girl standing next to him should have some say in how she spends the rest of her life, then stopped herself. Zoe didn't have much of a filter, but sometimes it did kick in during emergencies. She thought for a moment. Wait, if that's all you want, why did you ask for me? Why didn't you just grab her and go? You have to let her out of her contract, the slave deal you made her sign. I'm sorry, the what? You made her and all the other hosts sign a deal that they have to work out their year-long contract or else your people track them down. She can't go with me unless you release her from it. We want that plus money. Enough to get away. Ten million. The contract thing didn't sound right to Zoe. It's entirely possible that some of her businesses had been run that way at one time, but that was the kind of thing she put a stop to. Then her eyes met Shay's and the obvious truth hit her. That had been Shay's lie to stall Tilly. She hadn't been expecting him to actually call the owner to get it voided. Ah, right. But if you didn't find that out until you got here, it means you didn't come here planning to stage a hostage crisis. So, what's really in your backpack there? Your lunch? That, it turned out, had been the wrong thing to say. Dexter pushed Shay aside and flew across the gap between him and Zoe. His fingers, coated in segmented metal, were instantly around her throat. He pushed her back against the cold tiles. He then swung his other fist and it exploded into the wall next to Zoe's head, leaving a hole the width of a bowling ball and sending ceramic shards spraying across the room. Zoe's ears rained from the impact. Shay screamed. You know what these implants can do? hissed Tilly. I can smash your skull against this wall like a cracking an egg. You know that, right? Zoe clawed uselessly around her neck. Then she reached down frantically with her left hand, digging into her pocket. He said... So it doesn't matter whether or not I have the device, not to you, because you know I can smear these tiles with your brains without breaking a sweat, right? Shay begged him to stop, told him she didn't want this, any of it. Zoe's lungs burned, trying to pull in breath through her compressed windpipe. Her hand found her phone. She brought it up with her right hand, holding it so the screen was visible over Dexter's left shoulder. With a shaking thumb, she tapped the browser and brought up the list of hostage negotiation tips again. She found what she thought was the relevant sentence. She croaked. I can take that request to my people, but it will require some time. Dexter squinted in confusion, glanced back at the phone, then let her go. Zoe collapsed to the floor. He said, 
You're dumber than they told me you were. I know you own this place. I know you've got the money. Whatever I want done, you can do it with a word. Zoe struggled to catch her breath. Her throat was throbbing. I'm sorry. I'm used to being on Shay's end. Shay said, Can we please talk to that other guy instead? I want half of the ten million in dollars, said Tilly, and half in spoils, transferred to my hub account. Still sitting on the tile floor, Zoe folded her legs under her and let out a sigh. Her neck was burning and she was starting to feel clammy all over from the shower steam. She pushed her hair out of her face. You know I can't let you take her. You can't stop us. Us? You're acting like you're running off together. You think she wants this? Look at her. So what? For almost all of human history, this right here is how it was done. You wanted a woman, you acquired her. No different from livestock. I understand why now. Women don't know what they want. I can make Shay happy. She doesn't know it now because society has told her it's shameful to be with a guy like me. All we have to do is push through it. In time, she'll see. Zoe found herself wishing someone had in fact activated a device to melt her brain. I, uh, understand where you're coming from, Dexter. And it's good that you're honest about your desires. No, you don't even live in the same universe as I do. You notice 90% of the customers here are male? All of us, starving for this. Yeah, and 90% of the employees are girls, same as the sex workers in any of the thousand brothels in the city. You think they wouldn't prefer to be doing something else? Meanwhile, I have to do boring meetings with rich CEOs every week, and guess what? They are mostly guys. That's the world. Zoe had several vices in her life. Perhaps none were more dangerous than her addiction to pointless arguments. No, said Tilly, trembling with anticipation of finally putting all this into words. Look at you. You're, you're as fat as me and your face is nothing special. But even if you lost every penny, you could always find a guy to take care of you. Men have wanted what you have since before you even knew what it was, begged you for it, done you favors. Meanwhile, I was treated like a slug on a sidewalk, told every day that no one wants me. You'll never know what that's like. So, no, you won't talk me out of this. We're not even speaking the same language. I just came from a party. A bunch of people there I barely know. This gross old rich guy was hitting on me the whole time. Do you know what he liked about me? Your tits? That you look like you have no respect for yourself and will do anything in bed? He liked that I'm 23. How many years can pass before that window closes? All that humiliation you went through in school. All those cheerleaders getting treated like goddesses. I get it. I was there too. But each and every one of those girls is praying they can get their lives to a solid place before society declares them invisible. Meanwhile, a guy can get old and ugly and still pick up prom queens as long as he's got his life together. That can be you. Let Shay go. Maybe we can work something out. Turn your whole situation around. Dexter reached over and grabbed Shay, roughly this time. He pulled her in front of him, an arm around her neck, a gloved finger stroking her collarbone. I'm not giving her up to some fraternity douchebag. You have five seconds to tear up her contract, or I'll crush her windpipe. Zoe's hand instinctively shot up to her own neck. There is no contract. She just made that up to stall. Tilly scoffed and shook his head, as if he was annoyed with himself for falling for it. So we don't need you at all. Well, you do now. There's almost certainly a trigger-happy army waiting for you out there, and your implants don't make you explosion-proof. Then they'll take out Shay, too. We'll die together. If that's how it's destined to happen, so be it. I still want the cash. We're done talking. He raised his hand, putting his fingers around Shay's throat. Zoe reached up, touching the My Eyes Are Up There pendant, rubbing it between her fingers. Zoe said, stop. I said we are done talking. The shouts ricocheted around the tiles. I agree. Let go. Tilly loosened his grip. His eyes went wide. Confusion. Doubt. Zoe said, take your hand away from Shay's throat. Drop it by your side. He did just that, his eyes following his hand as it dropped. Terrified. His hand was acting on its own. Zoe said, I forgot to mention before now, but my company developed those implants. Well, one of my companies. One product we never sold publicly was the remote override. I've got one embedded in my necklace here. It's voice operated. Have a seat on the floor. Let's talk. D Dexter Tilly did not move. He was trying to lunge at Zoe. She could see him flexing, trying to make his body obey. His face was turning red with the effort. 
For the first time in his life, his arms and legs were not his own. People have nightmares when this happens, right? She touched the pendant and said, Sit on the floor. His body did as it was told. Thank you. Shay, if you want to slap him or kick him, now's your chance. Shay had backed away, trembling. I, I don't understand. What? I, I, I just want to, I just want to go. Can I go? I don't want some private security dope out there to gun you down in the confusion. Give me a minute and we'll all leave together. Now, we have several options for what we can do with Mr. Tilly here, and I'm leaving it up to you. If you want me to make him tear his own throat out, that's what we'll do. I don't want that. What do you want? I just want him to stay away. And you don't want an army of angry trolls coming after you later. You heard the chanting out there, right? It was clear from her expression that Shay hadn't considered that as a possibility. Do you like living here? In the city, I mean. Not particularly. We'll set you up with something. Whatever you want. To Tilly, Zoe said, You, on the other hand, deserve nothing. And right now, my associate, Will Blackwater, is telling the news cameras that we do not negotiate with terrorists, that I'm going to offer you the same less than nothing he offered, that your options are to give up or die. I know this because we planned it in advance, just as we plan to give you that cool-looking drone to smash in front of everybody, to show off how big and strong you are. But then, you're going to walk out that front door and announce that you're getting everything you wanted. You're going to say that you demanded we give you a job. Fortunately, I have an associate named Rico Hiera. He owns a very successful materials recovery company. They go into buildings that need to come down and rip out all the valuable stuff. You're offering me a construction job? I don't... Not construction. Deconstruction. You'll be smashing bricks, breaking glass, knocking down walls and listening to the wonderful sound they make when they fall. It's hard work, but the good kind. Rico is big on second chances, hires a lot of ex-cons and other shady types, and the job pays accordingly. But get on Rico's good side and, and you'll have your pick of jobs. His name means a lot around here. You can get your own place. Have a reason to get up every morning. A new start. And you'll be surprised how fast you put on muscle doing it. Zoe paused to give him a moment to take it in. To visualize it. Then. But Shay won't be there. That's not an option. We find you anywhere nearby. If you show up in the same city as her, you'll die and I'll feel nothing. All I have to do is push a button and overload your implants. Turn you into a pile of charcoal on the floor. If I ever hear you've pulled anything like this with anyone else, you die. If you tell anyone we have control over the implants, you die. That's information we're keeping under our hats, for now. Instead, you will say to the crowd that this was all your idea, that you've decided you want to work on yourself first, that women are all ungrateful harpies anyway. It'll be super convincing. Why? I mean, why offer me any of this? Because I believe that giving people second chances pays off in the long run, regardless of whether or not they deserve them. Bullshit. There's something else here. You fear me. You fear my people. Otherwise, you wouldn't be giving in. I can command your right hand to rip out your tongue and flap it against your scrotum for the rest of the week. Within 15 minutes, I could have your mother, brother, and nephews killed in their homes, and I would not be inconvenienced by so much as a visit from the police. I am giving you a chance, and it tastes like poison in my mouth to be giving you anything. But the private prisons in this city will just spit you out as twice the monster you are now. So there's this big, gross gap between what you deserve and what would actually make the world better. And even then, I'm giving Shay the right to take back this offer if at any moment she decides she's not cool with you going unpunished. Dexter stared daggers into Zoe. Then he worked his jaw and suddenly burst into tears. Zoe sat quietly as he did so. Her face was stone. After a while, she said, A year ago, I was living with my mom. We had nothing, because she had hitched her wagon to a rich psychopath who bailed before I was born, and I had hitched mine to a high achiever who eventually decided high achievers can't be seen in vacation photos with girls whose thighs look like this. My entire idea of the future was blown to pieces in a single late-night conversation conducted on my mom's back porch in a pair of lawn chairs. I didn't leave the trailer for three weeks. Caleb, his new girl, and all our old friends all went on vacation in Cuba, streamed the whole thing on Blink, these quarterbacks of life and their giggling trophies. I sat there in my room and watched it all. Every minute. I watched them sleep. I was too sick to eat, but still somehow gained six pounds. She shrugged. Skip forward a bit, and here I am. This life, Dexter. It crashes in on you. You get your heart broken and you get humiliated, but the sun rises the next day. The difference is I never tried to hurt any of them. 
never try to take what they have. You won't ever do anything like that again. You're free to move your limbs now. Tilly tested his right arm. He wiped his eyes. Oh, she said. Also, don't activate your implants. Not even to knock over walls for Rico. None of the devices you can buy on the black market are safe. They either overload and explode, or else they're calibrated wrong and you'll accidentally twist your own ligaments off. Tilly clearly wasn't listening. What if Shay changes her mind? What if she wants to see me? You'll never see her or speak to her again. Zoe stood, her legs feeling unsteady beneath her. She was relieved, but only because she was, of course, unable to see the future, to know exactly what chain of events she just set in motion. She had no idea, for instance, that at least one person in that room wasn't going to live to see Halloween. Let's go, she said. I have to get back home. My cat is going to be furious. Four. Zoe made it back to the gigantic ballroom of the enormous mansion she'd inherited from her ginormously corrupt father, only to find it empty of party guests. She heard a faint ripping sound and found her cat, named Stench Machine, under one of the circular white tables. He was casually shredding a cat-sized paper party hat with his claws. She reached down to stroke him, and he allowed it. In the center of the room was a giant cake shaped vaguely like him, a grumpy white cat with a dark splotch like a coffee stain on his face, and a chest and a studded collar around his neck. Only a few tiny pieces had been taken. Nobody eats at parties in Tabula Rasa. They just drink and nibble and then talk about how full they are. Even so, Zoe had hired a master sushi chef who'd rolled in with the whole setup that had to be unloaded from a truck, including cartons of fresh mackerel on ice. All of that was now gone, too. At one end of the room was a pink, ten-foot-tall octopus wearing sunglasses, frozen in place behind a turntable setup. The animatronic DJ they'd rented that someone had mercifully turned off before Zoe arrived. Champagne flutes sat abandoned on tables, some with delicate lipstick kisses on the rim. Nearby was a pair of ruby-red high heels someone had left behind. These people just go places and forget their shoes? Zoe sighed. She hadn't actually known any of these people. She turned her cat's birthday party into a fundraiser for an extremely important cause that Zoe couldn't remember at that moment. The ballroom had filled with rich locals wearing practiced smiles and elaborate wigs who either wanted on her good side or who just liked to be seen at these things. There was a reason Zoe had downed a fairly large anti-anxiety cookie before anyone had arrived. A monitor on the wall was still showing a blink feed of the hostage crisis aftermath. Zoe imagined her guests huddled around it, watching to see if Zoe would get killed and so they'd have an excuse to leave early. Then they'd left early anyway. Eh, she'd have done the same. Near the opposite wall was a green tarp covering a lump the size of a school bus. The hidden object was humming ominously. Zoe could feel it through the floor. To keep people from messing with it, a wet paint sign had been taped to the tarp. She wondered if anyone at the party had gotten curious and taken a peek. Zoe pulled on her phone and tried to call her mom to let her know she was okay, but got no answer. That was hardly unusual. Her mother had a hard rule about not breaking up in-person conversations for phone calls. Carlton, the butler who Zoe estimated was probably older than America, entered and said, Good to see you back in one piece, Miss Ash. I of course was unable to view the standoff itself, but I did get to see some harrowing moments on the TV there. That was a very tall ladder. Where did everybody go? Your mother and her friends left to go find a bar. I believe one of them is going through a difficult divorce, and she felt she needed support. The sushi chef feared that if he stayed, he would not approve the overtime, despite my reassurances to the contrary. I had him save you a plate, though he was not happy about that either. He asserted that even minutes old leftovers do not represent the true quality of his work. Many of the remaining guests left, as they assumed you would not be in the mood to deal with company after your ordeal. Others had already departed after realizing that they were not, as they had mistakenly believed, at a party hosted by world-famous blues singer Zoe Ashley. Zoe picked up Stench Machine and squeezed him. Crowds aren't his favorite thing anyway. Will entered next. Zoe had told everyone to meet up back at the ballroom, and seemed relieved that the party had dispersed. He glanced at the frozen robot octopus, rolled his eyes, then made a beeline for the open bar to pour himself a glass of scotch. Next came Wu, dressed in cleany black with harnesses and carrying a rifle case, like an exotic assassin in an action movie. He was immediately identifiable as a sniper, which would have been a terrible choice for a mission in a public location unless his goal was specifically to get caught, which it had been. Zoe said, 
Could you have shot through me if you'd had to? There were not actually any cartridges in the rifle. Even if there had been, I would have no idea how to program the proximity detonation triggers. I'm not trained in that type of weapon. A bodyguard who hides and shoots from 50 yards away is probably being a bit too proactive in his duties. No, I, I mean, would you have been able to make yourself do it, if you had to? Not shooting at the client is actually one of the very first lessons they teach you in bodyguard school. Zoe heard Echo Lean's heels clicking into the room. She wore a jade sweater over leather pants that covered a physique that had apparently been designed in a lab specifically to make Zoe feel bad about her own. She had recently added some gentle curls to her neck-length black hair as an additional insult. Echo said, That was crazy. Were you scared? A little bit. What was in your purse you tried to leave behind? A stun gun or something? A second override for the implants. It was on my keychain. We were worried you may have lost yours during one of the several times you fell down on the way in. Wait, how did you know he'd head for the employee lounge? Bud Billingsley was right behind Echo and answered for her. Tilly was taking suggestions from his fans on Blink Chat, so we got on there and fed him the idea anonymously. Told him it was a way to thwart long-range microphones. We had an entry team hacking the elevator to get back up there when you came out. Wouldn't have worked if we'd lost track of where you were in the building. Yeah, it's really sinking in now how much worse that could have gone. Could everyone see up my skirt as I was climbing up? Echo said. Well, uh, the bad news is that, yes, a clip from the ladder situation went viral immediately. The good news is those skull dot panties sold out nationwide within 20 minutes. There was an article about it. Probably an endorsement deal in it for you if you want. And, yes, I want to die. Andre Knox was the last to arrive, saying, Thought you were going to fall off that ladder. He glanced at a nearby table. Anybody want some cocaine? Somebody left quite a bit behind. Ah, uh, who turned off DJ Roctopus? Zoe said, All right, everybody gather around. I'm giving Wu an eight for his performance tonight. Wu looked confused. That's an eight out of ten. You played a convincing sniper and also said you wouldn't shoot through me. Wu, you are allowed a piece of that cat cake. Andre said, Wait, is this something we're doing now? When did this start? Yes, we're doing performance review scores. But an echo, you both get a nine. You guys were so on top of this guy that you were at the scene of the hostage crisis before it even became a crisis. Incredible work, to the point that it's a little creepy. Actually, Echo loses a point for telling me about the underwear thing, which I now can't stop thinking about. Echo, you should have lied. Make a note going forward. Still, you both get two pieces of the cat cake. Echo gave the cake a slightly alarmed look. Zoe had never seen her eat anything but leaves, lab-grown seafood-style meat, and endless varieties of protein shakes. She probably hadn't allowed herself to have cake since her ninth birthday. Bud said, That probably isn't as impressive as it looked. Only two places in the city you can get the implants done, and I've got somebody inside both, leaking to me whenever a patient shows up. Then Echo noted that our Mr. Tilly sent up every shade of red flag one can imagine. It's actually super impressive, guys. Andre, let's see. You get a seven. Oof. That's harsh, Zoe. On one hand, the spider tank thing was incredibly scary. On the other, I am getting the sense that you overspent on it, and also it got bashed into junk. That was the plan. As for the cost, there's two things to consider there. One, you always get shafted as a last-minute shopper. And two, do you want to live in a world in which any group of low laughs can raise the cash to get something like that? And really, it only added up to about two months' profit from one of the casinos. Will choked on his scotch. Zoe said, Normally a seven would not qualify for cat cake, but Echo may let you have her pieces. Will, you get a four. Andre said, Damn, Will. You're dragging this whole organization down. Be honest with me. Are you drinking again? Zoe said, On one hand, this entire thing was Will's plan, and it worked out exactly the way he said it would. On the other hand, Will's first plan, which was to splatter the hostage taker with a squad of guys with exotic weapons, was just shameful. I still think we should do it. Track him. Take him out. The moment he leaks the facts that we can override the implants, somebody will come up with a workaround to counter it. We can make it seem like an accident, if that makes you feel better. Why would that make me feel better? It's a million times better to get a bad guy to turn his life around than to get exploded by a railgun or whatever you had in mind. And what about Shay? What about all the future Shays? Our only alternative was to let the guy walk out with enough gain to save face. That creates incentive for others to do what he just did. The predators in this world can sense that weakness from across an ocean. So, you don't negotiate, and then the guy triggers his bomb before you kill him, and a couple hundred people die? That's what we want? Yes, because it saves lives in the long run. 
From that point on, everybody knows not to take hostages, because we have sent the message, loud and clear, that hostages are not valuable to us. If you care about the lives of innocent people, really care, you take away the financial incentive to hurt them. Otherwise, you're just creating a bill that somebody else will have to pay. Enough with that. You're upsetting stench machine. As punishment for that dismal performance, you must eat the entire rest of the cat cake all at once with your hands tied behind your back. The entire time, the rest of the team will take turns explaining in detail at least one thing they don't like about you. If you try to refuse, Wu will be allowed to chop off one limb of his choosing. Will finished his drink and set the empty glass on a nearby table. I'm going home. I'll talk to the manager of the night inn in the morning to see what it'll take for the staff to come back to work. I'm guessing it won't be cheap. Ugh, fine. He turned to go. Zoe said, Hey. Will stopped and turned. How did I do? Tonight, I mean. We're all still here, aren't we? That was all she would get from him. As he left, Zoe let out a long sigh that developed into a raspberry. Well, I'm going to go soak in my bathtub until I fall apart like a corned beef. There is one last thing, said Bud. Unless you don't want to deal with one last thing, in which case I can take care of it, but Shay is in the foyer. She wanted to have a word with you. Shay? Andre said, You know, the hostage? From the hostage situation that happened an hour ago. Why does she want to talk to me? It didn't feel right to interrogate her on the subject, said Bud. Want me to send her away? No, it's fine. It actually wasn't fine. Zoe wasn't in the mood to have this woman tearfully thank her and call her a hero. She'd find that just as draining as the standoff. Still, if Zoe could be said to have a job at all, this was it. Zoe found Shay standing just inside the huge etched bronze doors of the main entrance, bundled in a long jacket that was too warm for the weather and definitely too warm for the foyer. Her arms were folded like she was hugging herself, and her posture suggested that she thought the marble tiles around her were trap doors. She clearly wasn't used to being in places like this and seemed afraid that one wrong move would result in getting mauled by guard dogs. Zoe remembered the feeling. Hey, said Zoe as she descended the stairs. You holding up okay? Yeah, I think so. You wanted to talk to me? I'm really sorry. I just mentioned it offhand and your guy told me to wait here. It's fine if you don't have the time. I didn't mean it like, oh no, it's fine. I'm in for the night. It's just, your people are offering me all sorts of money and stuff, and I don't want it. That's all. I, I don't want to go back to the inn, but I'll find a different job. It's okay. I'm okay. Hey, I get it, said Zoe. She stepped off the bottom stair. I don't like accepting help from people either, but one thing I've learned is that sometimes the best thing you can do is say yes and then try to make the most of it. In terms of cost, don't worry about it. It's nothing compared to some of the other stupid junk we spend money on. It's not that. I don't... Please don't take this the wrong way, but I don't want to be a part of this. She waved her hand around the room. This thing, what you guys do, I can't get wrapped up in anything like this. If I'd known you guys owned that place, I wouldn't have taken that job. And please, please don't get mad at me for saying that. I don't have any problem with you. I really don't. But I can't get pulled into... I just... Shay was near tears. Oh, said Zoe, letting out a nervous chuckle that was completely inappropriate in the moment. You're talking about all the crime. You think if you take the money, then you're on our payroll and somebody's going to show up at your house a month from now and say, hey, we paid you, now you got to pay us back by whacking this union organizer we got beef with. Shay did not crack even the hint of a smile. I just want to go home. Shay, you've got us all wrong. Or, well, you've got me all wrong. Can I tell you a story? It'll take like 30 seconds. Shay didn't answer, but made a face like she was bracing herself to listen to a sales pitch while simultaneously rehearsing how to say no to it. I want you to imagine, said Zoe, that I gave you a piece of paper signing over everything I own, this huge mansion, all the businesses, everything, to you, right now. That's exactly what happened to me a little over a year ago. I'm not a crime person at all. I was a regular girl, just like you. So... What happened was, a famous crime boss got a random stripper pregnant and never gave her the time of day after that. 22 years later, he dies and leaves everything he owned to the stripper's baby that he had no relationship with whatsoever. That's me. I'm the stripper baby. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Hotels, casinos, apartment buildings, sex workers. That scary guy I showed up with, Will, he was my father's right-hand man. Same with the guy who brought you over here. His name is Bud. 
This is a team my father put together years and years ago. I inherited them along with all the rest. But I didn't know about any of this until last Christmas. I'm sorry that happened to you. And I get that you can't get out. But I can't get sucked into all this. I can't wind up like you. What? No, no. I can get out. We can leave together, right now. These people all work for me. They all have to do what I say. It's fine. It's all fine. Shay was truly thrown for a loop by this. They're not making you do it? Ah, well, yeah, I see why you're asking that. Not to get into my whole sad history or anything, but if you could see what I had waiting for me back home, you'd understand. We had nothing. I lived in a trailer and it had an ant problem, so every once in a while you'd go to pour a bowl of cereal and you'd pour the milk in and look down at your spoon and see a dozen ants floating in it. So I didn't have much of a life to go back to, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, but you couldn't just take the money and leave? You just took over the mob instead? Zoe crossed her arms. She suddenly felt like she was on trial. We really have gotten rid of the bad stuff. I mean, a lot of it is still prostitution and gambling, but it's not the kind of thing where we're ambushing people in an alley and stealing their jewelry. I wouldn't stand for that. Hell, that's why I stayed. To clean up the operation. They were doing some pretty terrible stuff before. And my father, he was a monster. His father was even worse. Or, that's what I hear anyway. But you kept all those same people around. The ones who did all the bad stuff. Well, they were the only ones who knew how to run everything. And trust me, they know all the rules. They step out of line and they're gone. I mean, I really am doing my best here. It's not easy. It was clear Shay sensed she'd stepped over a line. It was also clear that Shay fully believed Zoe would have her killed and dumped into the river if she persisted. In the course of the conversation, Shay had edged back toward the doors by a couple of steps. Okay, okay, said Shay. I believe you. Still, I don't want your money. I don't want it to turn into a thing at tax time, or, or if I could get in trouble for accepting illegal income. First, it's not illegal. These are legitimate businesses with thousands and thousands of people on the payroll all around the world. It's all getting filed with the IRS. It's all above board. Second, and this is the important part, we're not doing this as a charity. If you stay in the city, you're going to bump into that guy, Tilly, at some point, and who knows what he's going to do. Plus all the weirdos who are cheering him on out there. Maybe they wouldn't do anything, and maybe they would, but, you know, why tempt fate? We can even provide security staff, just for peace of mind. And these doubts you're having? They're the same ones I felt last year. But in the end, hey, the money is going to go to somebody, so... Why not you? If I take it, can you promise that I'll never see any of you again? That scary guy isn't going to show up at my door? You mean Will? <laughs> yeah, I'll make sure you never have to see him, and he's not that scary once you get to know him. He's terrifying, and if you don't see that... Shay abandoned the sentence, apparently sensing it was heading toward dangerous territory. Anyway, can I go? Please? Of course. You're not a prisoner. Door's unlocked. One of my people will drive you. No, no, I've called for a ride already. Thank you. Are you sure? We can... Shay was already pulling the door open. She slipped through and Zoe heard brisk, nervous footsteps fade into the night. Five. Zoe was still agitated from her conversation with Shay when she crawled into bed a few hours later. As she tossed and turned, she thought about a sign on the wall of her old workplace, posted back by the coats in Department of Labor Notices. It was a supposedly motivational quote that said, A flaw in the human character is that everybody wants to build, and nobody wants to do the maintenance. Kurt von Gutt. The manager had it hung there because she was always complaining about the staff not cleaning up the espresso machines properly, and it was probably the only inspirational poster she could find that seemed to be scolding people for not taking better care of the equipment. But Zoe thought about that quote constantly, especially in light of the turn her life had taken in the last couple of years. When you get sick of what's in front of you, yeah, fixing it is never as appealing as just walking away and starting fresh. It's the reason the landfills are choked with stuff that could easily be repaired, and it's the reason action movies are always about killing psychopaths instead of helping them get better mental health meds. It's the reason Zoe's supposed soulmate, Caleb, had decided to just go find a girl with better genes, and it's the reason, according to Will, that the city of Tabula Rasa exists. Mankind, he had told her, had spent much of the 20th century dreaming of colonizing the stars. Why fix civilization when you can just run away and build a brand new one? But by the 1980s or so, everyone had soured on the idea. 
colonizing Mars, everyone eventually realized, would be unbelievably difficult, and the only reward for interplanetary trailblazers would be that they'd have to live on goddamned Mars. By the early 2020s, a new and better idea started to take hold among the ultra-wealthy and powerful. Just recolonize the Earth instead. Go find some sparsely populated area with a weak or disinterested government, and just start building a brand new city that would function under its own rules. Everything could be fresh, new, and efficient, free of the baggage and stagnation that was weighing down the rest of the modern world. And really, what's the worst that could happen? Other than the new city descending into a dystopian hell of poverty, terror, and bloodshed? These ludicrously expensive social experiments were often called charter cities, and soon every obscenely wealthy and or powerful clique wanted one to call their own. Scientologists started one in Taiwan, some famous communists did the same in Northern California, and a bunch of libertarian tech billionaires were, at the moment, building a floating island nation off the coast of French Polynesia. Tabula Rasa, by far the most successful and well-known of the bunch, had been planted in southwestern Utah by a cabal of flamboyant criminals, apparently over a petty grudge. Spearheading the project had been Arthur Livingston, Zoe's biological father, a self-made crime kingpin. And here, self-made, means he gave himself a fake wasp-sounding name to conceal his connections to his own wealthy Armenian gangster father. Arthur's group had been run out of Las Vegas, and, mostly out of spite, planted their flag in a spot position to siphon away Sin City's most profitable tourists in Wales. The founders played up the new city's lawlessness, Arthur doing media appearances telling potential residents and developers alike to stay away if they couldn't handle it. Tabula rasa, he'd say while grinning and stabbing a finger at the camera. It's not for pussies. If you're not man enough, well, there's a loser's train to Vegas that leaves every hour. People couldn't move there fast enough. Zoe stared at the ceiling. She really wanted to roll over, but Stench Machine was sleeping in the hammock formed by the blanket between her legs, and disturbing him was, of course, unthinkable. She didn't ask Will much about Arthur's early years. When she did, what she got back were anecdotes that everyone at the table thought were hilarious, but that Zoe found sickening. She knew that several years after Arthur got Zoe's mother pregnant, North Korea fell into civil war. The two events are thought to be unrelated. Arthur then used the war as cover for a human trafficking scheme that blatantly violated the laws of the DPRK, the United States, and common human decency. In the process, he encountered Will Blackwater, Bud Billingsley, and Andre Knox, who were doing equally illegal off-the-books psyops work on behalf of the U.S. government. Once back in the States, Arthur recruited all three to ill-defined roles in his organization that would take advantage of their unique training. Arthur had apparently once confided to Will that if one possessed the skill to craft sufficiently elaborate and convincing lies, then no other skills were really necessary. Yet, over the next 15 years, Arthur apparently began to have some minor regrets about the fact that his business practices had caused untold human suffering across several continents. He joined a church started charities that actually gave money away instead of just laundering it, and grew an elaborate mustache. That last one may seem unrelated, but he saw it as a crucial part of his personal rebranding. This attempt to go legit, unfortunately, steered Arthur into unfamiliar waters he was ill-equipped to navigate. His enemies closed in, now possessing the power to make bricks shatter like glass and steel melt like wax. Thus, the man whose high school class would have voted him most likely to leave a giant smoking crater when he dies, had such an award, or his high school actually existed, did exactly that. It was only after his murder that it was discovered he had left his entire empire to a daughter he'd only spoken to once in his entire life. Arthur had not disclosed this decision with anyone, and predictably, chaos ensued. On several occasions, Zoe nearly joined Arthur in that part of the afterlife, reserved for people who die particularly weird and gruesome deaths. But she made it through, much to everyone's surprise. And that's how, in the autumn of the following year, Zoe wound up standing in her foyer, trying desperately to explain herself to Shay Laverne, and probably doing a terrible job of it. Why had she stayed there, sleeping in the same home as her infamous father? and doing a job with duties so alarmingly vague and varied that the news usually just referred to her as an heiress. The real reason was one that she rarely articulated even to herself, because it was probably the same reason Arthur had left the business to her in the first place. Sometimes, the story of your life gets so jumbled and messy that you just want to erase it completely, like some kind of, you know, clean slate. Stench Machine found a better spot at the corner of the bed and Zoe rolled over finally feeling herself drifting off. 
She thought that she'd dream of superpowered nerds smashing into her room and twisting her head off. Instead, she plunged immediately into the nightmare she'd had a hundred times since moving to the city. She was back in Fort Drayton, Colorado, late for her shift at Java Lodge. She was trying to start her old car and it was giving her that battery discharge error and she'd already been told if she was late one more time that she'd be fired and Cassie was managing and Zoe knew she wouldn't cover for her and she kept hitting the start button over and over and she was crying as she watched the time tick down the dashboard clock and Zoe jolted herself awake. She rolled over and the last thought she had before drifting off again was that she'd rather die than go back to there, to that place she was in her life less than one year ago. Literally, rather die.